Welcome to this episode of Revelations from Heaven. My guest today is Wade Cummins, a.k.a. Elvis Wade. The reason is that he has uh, been a singer in his own right, but also he has been what we commonly refer to as an Elvis impersonator. Not only that, but he has been one of the most pre premier performers uh, across the world, selling out to audiences of 30, 40,000 people. He has played the uh, actual vocalists who sung with Elvis Presley. Uh, they joined Wade and his performances, and also Elvis Presley himself appeared at one of his performances and gave him a rare standing ovation. So, but we're talking about also today something that was very important to his own life, and that is tragically, he lost his daughter. And he met in a starry sky, in a light, bright sky, he met Jesus and his daughter who had passed from this world. So, Wade, we have some amazing things to talk about. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you, Randy. My pleasure. It's just such a, you know, I, my wife and I watch you every night. We spend our mornings in prayer time. We we open with Jesus and we close with Jesus. So we watch one or two of your episodes uh, every night as we're in bed. And uh, it blesses us so much. And to, you know, hear the common testimonies that that people share with a Feelings that, that I went through and everything when I saw Jesus and met Jesus. Yeah, it's so great. <laughs> well, uh, uh, praise the Lord. I, I, I'm just, w we have blessed, I guess, each other because I have watched your performances. I've watched a movie that you wrote called The Identical, which is based primarily about what 70 percent on your life there's a bit of fiction in there as well but it's one of my favorite movies now ray liotta uh played yeah. your father ashley judd is in one of the stars in the film as well so we'll have the links to that uh so you can watch if you haven't watched it i encourage you to watch it it's an amazing film that is based on wade's life and uh and, and, and I think of all of them, I, I was a, a fan of uh, Elvis Presley, got to see him when he was alive. And I, of all of the performers, I would say that you have most, are most likened to him both in the, in the style and your voice is amazing. So, and you're still doing that. And I, and I, and I want to see you in person someday, hopefully. Well, I would love that, Randy. You know, I tell you something, I, it's a gift from God. I, I grew up looking like him. You know, I never, I didn't plan that, but I, uh, I had three teenage sisters. God, you know, there's no happenstances in God, but I had my teenage sisters when I was young, they bought every Elvis record and they, they were 45s then they would play all one side, pick them up, play the, I heard it 24 seven Elvis, Elvis, Elvis. <laughs> so little did I know that I would grow up looking like him. And then singing like him, you know, my natural singing voice is very Elvis, but, you know, I don't try to put it on. It's just there. And uh, I think the main reason why my success it was all natural. A lot of the guys, they they just study him and they study every move. They study every inflection. <laughs> I never did that. You know, wow. it just came natural. Wow. So God has used it in my life and praise God. I give him all the glory, all the glory. Well, your, your life is somewhat parallels Elvis's life. Um, you said you were the uh, the son know. of a moonshiner, I guess. <laughs> so 11, <laughs> 11 children, you know, in Tennessee, you know, very, very uh, somewhat similar uh, uh, backgrounds. But uh, and then we'll get to the part which was. I'm assuming was the most traumatic you've ever had, uh, certainly up to that point with the loss of your daughter. And then you had a miraculous encounter with both uh, the Lord Jesus and your daughter. And uh, I know you are a sold out uh, believer in Jesus. 
and you teach on Sunday and you're teaching others and bringing bringing uh, the Lord into even your performances and how you exude um, his his character through your through your singing. Uh, so I, I just um, am delighted and honored to be with you. Um, so tell us a little bit if we can if you will wait about your your family and then what led up to your your daughter and your family and your uh, and your loss of your daughter and how all of that uh, transpired before you became uh, one of the most famous uh, performers in the world. Well, I started playing, my, I come from a musical family. My mom played 11 different instruments. And I, my dad played a couple, both of them sang. And we had the traditional family circle, you know, like they have in the South. My brothers and sisters sang and played guitar. And we would have the family circle. So as a child, that's all I knew. And I used to sit, my, they, you know, I was just a punk little kid. <laughs> they didn't want to show me guitar or anything. So, so I would sit in the middle of the circle and watch their fingers on the guitar and what, and then when they would take a break, I would grab a guitar and run back in the bedroom and put my fingers on the guitar <laughs> in the places where I saw them. And I learned myself how to play guitar. And, uh, so that's how it started. And I joined my first band when I was 13 years old and the other boys in the band were 16. And I, you know, there are born leaders. I say there, most people are sheep, they're followers, but I was never a follower. And, uh, you know, I booked the band. I was the leader of the band. I paid the band members uh, and told them what to wear. And they're all three years older than me. But, you know, they like to go to the wild parties, drink, do some drugs. And I never did that. I never drank in my life, never smoked, never had a marijuana cigarette in my hand. Never done drugs. But it was not, you know, I had tons of peer pressure. But I didn't do it, and I didn't want to do it. And uh, so anyway, I, I performed with that band until I was like 16 years old. And then when I was 17, uh, I was married at 17 years old, way too young. Mm. Uh, I had three children by the time I was 21. And so I started playing nightclubs and making really good money playing nightclubs. And I was the leader of that band, lead singer. So I joined them and, and I was making enough money to support without working any place else other than the one job. Give God the glory for that. And then this big show group called me on the phone and got me involved in that. And when they told me what kind of the money they were making, which was triple what I was making, mm. I said, uh, I'm in. So I went and auditioned and they hired me and, and I did uh, several vocal impressions. God blessed me with a, four octave range in natural voice if i go into falsetto then i got a five octave range but i could do elvis Roy orbison the gene pitney frankie valley of the four seasons tom jones uh buddy holly so i would do those things in that group and that's kind of where the elvis thing started there were no elvis impersonators i was the first now, some of these guys might claim it but i don't believe it i never there i would have known but but someone, I always looked like Elvis, and people would call me. They didn't know my name when we would play these. We called them uh, showrooms. And they would say, hey, Elvis, come here, come over here, come over here. And they'd always say, I want to buy you a drink. And I'd say, okay. And they'd say, what do you want? i go, a Coke. They said, no, man, let me buy you a real drink. I'm going to buy you a drink. I said, well, if you don't want to buy me a Coke, I won't take nothing. <laughs> <They'd> say, <laughs> They would say, okay, bring him a Coke. But after a while, they, they respect me. You know what? This man don't drink. This man don't smoke. <laughs> it's, et cetera. But I hung on to that. I never, never did any of those things. But calling me Elvis, because I was seeing Elvis on stage, but I never did an impression. But when I was a kid, I used to do an impression of Elvis, and everybody thought it was cute. You know, they thought I was real cute. And so uh, I told the band that night, I, I said, why don't I just do my old Elvis impression? That I used to do. And I said, you guys back me up. And they said, okay, that sounds like fun. So I jumped off the stage and we did, the first song I did was One Night With You. And girls started screaming like crazy. And I just thought they were laugh making fun of me and laughing because I was in on the joke and I just thought it was a joke. And then they wouldn't let me sit down. They kept beating on the tables, hollering more. So I, for 40 minutes, I, I sang every Elvis song we had mm -hmm. in the repertoire. And uh, we all thought it was fun, didn't think anything about it. 
but we were off on that was a Saturday night. We were off on Sunday, and I come back Monday, and I couldn't get in the parking lot. I had to park two blocks away, and I thought, "What is going on?" Hmm. I I went back. I had to, I took my base out of the case of, of my trunk. I had to walk two blocks just, and there was a line out the door, and. I went in and the place was jam packed and there must've been a hundred people standing on down there on Monday night. I mean, that's the slowest night of the week back then. And, uh, nobody in the band knew what was going on. They said, we don't know. I said, is a holiday? No, I don't know what's going on. And so anyway, when we went on stage, people started hollering. We want Elvis. We want Elvis. We all looked at each other like, Oh my God. You know, I mean, I would like to say it was a, a brainchild of mine, but it wasn't, it came from up above. So they said, what are we going to do? I said, well, the only thing I know to do is what we did the last time. They said, okay, we'll back you up. So I jumped out on the floor and did another 45 minutes of Elvis with the women screaming, <laughs> going crazy. I was a lot better looking then. <laughs> <laughs> Weren't we all? <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, anyway, from that moment on, you couldn't get in the place. And uh, newspapers started coming out. TV shows started coming out interviewing me and it became history and uh the group was called lafayette and the lasabers which was <laughs> i mean that was a name for back you know you know they always had those crazy names back in those years and so we played this one place and uh i was coming in with my bass guitar and the owner up on the marquee was trying to put up there and he said i can't i don't have enough letters to put lafayette and the sabers featuring Wade as Elvis. I don't have enough letters. And I was just joking. I said, oh, just put up there, Elvis Wade. And I walked away, you know, thinking, I didn't think anything about this, walk, walked in laughing. So the rest of the band members come in, they said, what's on the sign out front? I go, what? He said, they, Elvis Wade, what is that? I said, <laughs> did you put that up there? They said, yeah. <laughs> so even that was a, a farce, you know, I, I wasn't planned. And the same thing, we we packed the place. You could not get in. If you if you weren't there three hours before the show started, you couldn't get in the doors. And so it just went from there. And that's kind of how I got started. Uh, you know, and I played, like I said, three different instruments. I played guitar, bass guitar, and I played trumpet, some trumpet, enough to get by. And I played bass with one hand, trumpet with the other one. And then I was the lead singer. So, but... Pretty soon I found out I need to put those instruments down and just sing. <laughs> yes. Well, your voice is uh, stellar. You know, it it seems that, um, you know, the Lord has you on the road, certainly, and you become extraordinarily successful in performing. And I encourage our audience to look at some of the performances. And if you have the opportunity to, to see uh, Elvis Wade at some point in the future, uh, you'll be uh, greatly entertained. But then in the, in the height of your popularity is your, and your, your children are growing and your daughter, you're close to her. Uh, and then, then the Lord is, uh, is getting your attention in a different way. And certainly one that is diametrically opposed to the accolades that you've received uh, during your performances. Correct. Yes, I was, uh, you know, on the road a lot. You know, I would, we would fly to a lot of places and then we would, I would lease a bus uh, to many places. And so uh, in 1990, um, you know, I, I don't want to blame anything on my ex-wife, but, you know, I was gone and some, not I wasn't gone really that much, but I was gone some. She got, she went to college <laughs> And got to hanging out with some divorcees, and one thing led to another, and we ended up in the middle of the divorce. Well, they say that the two two uh, most painful things you can go through are losing a child and going through a divorce. Well, in the middle of this divorce, uh, you know, one night my my daughter's friend and my kids were all raised Christians; they went to church. They were baptized and they went to Christian school and I was making the money to pay for Christian school. And Misty, uh, she got a call from her girlfriend and her girlfriend, uh, her car wouldn't start. And she said, can you come and get me and, uh, and, and take me and drop me off at work? And she said, yes. So she dropped her off. And on the way back to the house, there was a guy that had just got out of prison. He stole his grandmother's car. 
that very day, Wynn got totally drunk and he was driving down at that time, a 40 mile an hour speed limit road in, in Lebanon, Tennessee, which is where we live. And he hit her from behind and, and they, they guesstimated 90 miles an hour, mm. but he didn't hit her directly, he hit her on the side of the, I mean, say a quarter of the back bumper and drove her car sideways into an oncoming truck the other way. She hit head on into an oncoming truck. And to, to make a long story short, she, she got killed in the middle of, you know, she it killed her. And I have never been so devastated in my entire life because I love my kids. I got the great, you know, everybody probably argue about their kids, but I had the greatest kids in the world. Mm-hmm. My kids all love the Lord. And uh, they're phenomenal kids. And, and I loved her so very, very much. Her name was Misty. When she didn't make it, it just devastated my life. And uh, so I was going through the two things, both at the same time. And uh, I would go to her grave every day, and I would write her a letter, and then I would fall prostate across her grave and just cry. And I would take the letter and stick it down in the ground, and I just had a letter on top of letter on top of letter, and I would talk to her. And in the denomination that I went to, and I call it a denomination because it wasn't, I'm not going to mention it, but, you know, they they didn't believe, they think, you know, if you weren't going to church which is a building you were backslidden well misty when she got out of college not college out of high school i mean she went to a, she would go to church maybe one sunday and then maybe she not might not go for two or three sundays and she'd come back and go for a couple Sundays. you know kids when they get that age mm-hmm. and so i didn't know if she was in heaven or hell and uh it it drove me crazy because i w- i was hurting so bad randy and now I know what hell is like, and I had no idea what I was talking about. But I would tell God, if she's in hell, kill me. I want to go there. Hmm. That's how much I missed her. The loss of a child is so devastating if you love your children. And I love my children. I would have went to hell for her just to be with her. Hmm. But so the state of mind that I was in couldn't get any peace and uh, I got a big, I had a big house and on 35 acres with a private lake. I'd made all this money and money meant no money, didn't mean anything to me anymore. Uh, I didn't want to work. In my opinion, I had nothing to work for. So I, I stopped my career, just cut it off. No more. I didn't want to play anymore. Didn't want to sing anymore. Didn't want to do anything anymore. And I would walk eight and nine miles at, at a time, just walking, because walk, the only way I could get any relief was to walk. And I would walk and walk and walk. And so I was just devastated over my daughter. And so I went over to my sister's house one morning, about, it was about eight o'clock. And it was one of those days where the sky was so thick. It was so black. It was like five minutes before dark. You've seen those days. No sunshine in anywhere. There was no clouds passing by. It was just dark and drizzling rain. And I stayed there for about 20 minutes. And I, I, I was so hurt. And again, I couldn't stay. I thought I got to go back home. So I got back in. I was driving a pickup truck. And I got back in my pickup truck and I started down the road. And I got to thinking, you know, Wade, you were so on top of the world. Your kids were in private school. You had the big house. You had 15 people working for you. You played some of the largest venues in the world. You, you know, your kids are all uh, good kids. Every everything was wonderful in your life, and now you have you're not you don't have control of anything. You're totally out of control. You can't control one single thing in your life. You've lost your daughter, and your marriage and your family, as you know it, is split up forever. And then I thought, you know, the worst thing that I've done. I thought to myself, I thought the worst thing that I've done in all of that is. I walked away from God as I knew him because I knew God from a standpoint of going to church on Sunday mornings, Sunday nights and Wednesday nights. That's how I knew him. Mm-hmm. I didn't know him at all. And, uh, but in the way that I knew him, I thought the worst thing I've done is I've walked away from you, God. And as I said that I began to weep, Randy, and I started crying. I tell people, I was crying the hardest I've ever cried in my life. Tears 
the, the worst pain that I had ever felt in my entire life were rolling down both cheeks and falling onto my pants. And I'm sitting in my pickup truck and I screamed out, I hope held my head back like this right here. And I screamed out, God, is there any way that you can forgive me? And I wasn't, you know, thinking about anything. And all of a sudden, a light about the size of a pen pierced through that black sky. Of course, it caught my attention. And I turned and looked at light and I slowed down with my pickup truck and the, the whole sky just went parted away just like that. And I looked up and I saw two figures. And of course, I'm, I'm just staring at them. And they came down all the way up there with this. And the light got brighter and brighter and brighter and bigger. They came down and suspended about four feet off the ground. I'm looking into the face of Jesus Christ mm. and my daughter. Now, people might say, why would he bring your daughter back? And I wrote a song, my wife and I did, called He Parted the Heavens for Me. He, he baptized me in the Holy Spirit personally. And as I said, when I saw him, he radiated love. It came out of him in waves. It hit me and would hit me. And I would go, oh, the greatest feeling I have ever felt in my entire life. I just want, I couldn't, and but I couldn't breathe. The human body, I understand why we have to have spiritual bodies because the human body cannot we cannot stand in front of the the lord of god we just can't mm -hmm. we our bodies can't can't handle it and then a a wave of joy came out of him hit me and i would oh, take another like that right there and when it hit me and i write my song tears of pain turned to great joy while still rolling down my cheek i went from the most pain i had ever been in my life to the most joy down my cheeks and then a it went from went from love to joy to peace and just one wave love joy peace just wave after wave and i and i'm just i'm about to crumple and i've got it out of my mouth i said oh, lord if, if, if you don't back up i'm going to explode i felt like i was the inside of my body was going to turn into a thousand million pieces mm. and so he backed away from me and I was able to, you know, talk to him. But I, I was telling Christy on the phone, I said, you know, the one thing that I was ashamed to tell people, and I learned through your through your experiences, I had never heard of a near-death experience. But when I would give my testimony, I'd say, they didn't talk, they, they never opened their mouths, but I heard every word they said. I couldn't understand that. Well, they were speaking to me in mental telepathy. And so I would hear, <laughs> I was speaking to them, but they weren't, they were talking to me, but they weren't opening their mouths. Mm -hmm. And so Jesus, he baptized me in the Holy Spirit. And my daughter, Misty, he brought her back because of the pain and anguish I was in. The song that we wrote called, He Left All Heaven Waiting to Save One Lost Sheep. Mm -hmm. Well, he left heaven waiting for this one person. We need to understand the love of Christ, the pain that I was in was unbearable and he knew that I couldn't go the rest of my life because I had been told and taught that just because my daughter uh, had 18 or well she was 20 by this time but between those years wasn't in church every Sunday that she was lost how could I go through the rest of my life not knowing where she was at mm -hmm. and that's the kind of love that he had he came to me and she spoke to me and she said daddy she you know in the south was never dad or father was daddy she said daddy i don't want you to worry about me anymore mm -hmm. i'm with jesus daddy and i'm the happiest i've ever been mm -hmm. i'm happy and uh i spent 45 minutes with my lost 45 minutes randy and uh, i was transported eight miles from that spot to my house one minute i'm there and next minute i'm i'm under my carpool and I'm going, Lord, what happened? I, I've never been transported before, had any experience like that at all. But I was so full of the Holy Spirit, and you understand this. I have told my testimony so many times. And, of course, most of the time I cry through it, especially when I start talking about my baby. I I can't hold back the tears. You know, it's it's, it's really hard. But he he gave me something. I never went back to that grave again. Went every day, and I never went back because I knew she wasn't there. Mm -hmm. I knew that was a body that was not her. But he began talking to me. You know, I, I, 
he began talking to me about everything and I couldn't believe it. I thought I was going nuts. I'm going crazy. God's talking to me. Uh, And see, I was taught God don't speak to us anymore. We got the Bible and that's the end of it. I didn't know anything about the gifts of the spirit. I, I would start telling, but you know, Randy, here's what would happen to me. I did. I craved that high. I understand why drug addicts, you know, the devil has a, a, uh, opposite of everything God has. He has the drugs which ruin your life, but the Holy Spirit fills you up and it will, you know, it will, oh my goodness, explode your life. Yes. And every time I would start telling some about my, my testimony, I start crying and I get filled with the Holy Spirit and I'd be so high and I want more and more. So I just had to keep telling them about Jesus. Uh-huh. <laughs> and the people that I went to church with thought I was nuts. I tried to go back to that church. But I was like a square peg trying to fit into a round hole. They tried to tell me that something else had happened to me. And I told them, listen, (laughs) what I got, what Jesus gave me, you can't take away from me. You can't. You didn't give it to me and you can't take it. And uh, so God had to take me to a little town in Wyoming, Riverton, Wyoming. And I had no idea why I was going there. But I got introduced to a pastor in an Assembly of God church. And I and. And I seen them operating in, in the gifts. And I had been operating. I, I would see people sick. And I would tell them, you know, God has shown me this. And I'm, I'm healthy as a horse. The next day, they'd be in the hospital. And then I'd start crying. And, you know, they would be told that they were dying and they weren't going to live. And I would cry all night. And I would pray, why would you show me that? And God would tell me then. And I'd pray for them. And they would be miraculously healed. And I didn't know anything about the gifts. I didn't know nothing about them. I was never taught about them. Here I am operating them. So I asked the pastor out there, I ran up to him. And I said, I got to know, you got what I got. What is it? What is it I got? And he said, you got the baptism of the Holy Spirit. I go, what is that? <laughs> I go, I don't even know what that is. I started telling them about, they were the only ones that didn't think it strange that I was seeing things about people, prophesying, laying hands on the sick and then recovering seeing miracles it wasn't strange to them they just like yeah yeah right yeah (laughs) so so my life never turned around i tried to become a three-piece i laughed because i went out and hung my jumpsuits up as i said and i was not going to sing no more and god had to show me that i didn't call you out of what you were doing wade cummins doesn't have a platform but you built a platform uh, through Elvis Wade that you can speak to people and so that's what he did you know he said I want you to go back and start singing again use your name but use it for my glory mm. and I said fantastic so I have been doing that now for 34 years wow 30. wow you know they um, and what what followed uh, in your in your career your calling uh, was that once Elvis Presley had passed, uh, his vocalist joined you and someone else from uh, the Presley family. Yeah, the Jordanaires came with me and spent, oh my goodness, 12 and a half years with me. And we did hundreds of concerts together. And Dee Presley, his stepmother, uh, contacted me. Actually, the Jordanaires, I didn't contact. It was all God orchestrated, Randy. I got a call from Gordon Stoker. And he said, uh, I didn't believe it was him. He got my phone number because I was unlisted from one of the agents. And he said uh, he could. He had a hard time convincing me that somebody wasn't playing a joke. That it was really him. Mm. And he said, I have this uh, agent that wants us to do a, uh, a group of concerts in New Zealand. And they wanted the best Elvis act in the United States. And we told him, well, that's easy. It's Elvis Wade. They said, can you get him? And he said, well, I can try to get a hold of him. And so it ended up, we didn't even end up doing that tour, but it ended up that the big agency that I was with, Tony, uh, anyway, Buddy Lee Attractions, Tony was a, an agent that I dealt with. Uh, he said, how would you like to play Cardinal Stadium with the Jordanaires? Hmm. Cardinal Stadium in Louisville, Kentucky. And I thought, man, that's that's a little bit out there, man. You know, that's a big place. So we did end up doing Cardinal Stadium together and just tore the place down. And uh, we had thousands and thousands of people. And so from that point, you know, they just, we clung to each other. They became like brothers to me. Mm. Uh, my family, you know, were their family. 
And uh, they stayed with me for 12 and a half years. Of course, they're all passed away now except for Ray Walker, the bass singer. He's still alive, but he's in bad shape. Mm. But uh, <clears throat> And Dee actually contacted me. Dee Presley, his stepmother, she was in Nashville, and Elvis had talked about my show and coming to see me. And she said, is there any way I can get a hold of this Elvis Wade? And they said, yeah. So they got a hold of me and said, she'd like to meet you. Would you meet her? And I said, yeah, sure. So I went to, uh, uh, they were, she was going to Printer's Alley with a group of people. And I went down there and met her. And of course, we became friends. And, you know, uh, she she became a press agent to me. And then she wanted to travel. And I said, yeah, sure. And she was a trooper. I had 15 pieces. And she'd ride that bus and sleep in a bunk like, I have to give her that credit. She was mm -hmm. a trooper. And we played, we played all over the country, Mexico City, the Auditorium National, which is a beautiful facility in Mexico City. And uh, she she stayed a press agent for about five and a half years. And I was close with her and her three sons, Billy and David and uh, Ricky. And uh, at that, when she finally passed away, she lived in Madison. When she passed away, I went to her funeral. Mm. But uh, God dropped all those people in my life. And it was, for, I guess it was... For purpose, because no. uh, Elvis could have reached so many, many millions of people. And I tell people, listen, don't worship Elvis. Worship even Elvis says, "I'm not the king. There's only one king," and he said, "That's Jesus Christ." Mm -hmm. And uh, of course, I don't know if he's in heaven or where he's at. Uh, I hope that he went there. I know he had a lot of problems in his life, but I believe in my own way, God has used me to reach tons and tons of people for Christ. Mm. As I said, you know, he called us a fisher of men. And I love to fish. I really, I, I love to, you know, fish on the ocean and on the lakes, both. And I said, I never caught a fish on an empty hook. So mm. God gave me the best bait in the whole world, which is <laughs> Elvis. <laughs> Amen to that. I, I don't think there's a, a more probably esteemed or followed uh, performer in the scope of history than uh, modern history, at least, than uh, Elvis. How did, I'm, I'm curious, Wade, how your life was transformed post this amazing encounter in the supernatural. That is, when, when God was speaking to you and your daughter, who uh, was in heaven, and you were translated into this place where the Lord had blessed you with this encounter. And the th from the things he said, and of course, your daughter's saying that uh, she's the most joyful she's ever been in heaven. How did that transform you from, let's say, uh, B.E., before encounter days, to uh, A.E., after encounter days, if you will? How, how did that transform kind of the way that you performed, the way that you lived, all of those things? Well, you know, God grows us a little bit of time, Randy. As you know, we're a work in progress and uh, he don't just change it from black to white overnight. Right. We are we're slowly changed to become more and more like Christ. So slowly the, the Elvis moves kind of dissipated <laughs> on stage. <laughs> and um, I, I witnessed and started witnessing that in all my shows. I would do gospel songs in all my shows. Uh, the promoter in Europe threatened to kick me out and not pay me and everything else because I was, he called it, whatever this is you call it, witness and stuff, I wanted to stop. And he said, uh, you know, I did, I tried, probably did 150 interviews in Europe. And I always witnessed Jesus. I said, this is why I'm here. I'm not here to lift up Elvis. I'm here to lift up Jesus Christ. I had a quarter page ad in uh, the, the Telegram, the, uh, the London Telegram, which they told me back then, they said, that's impossible. Nobody gets that. Well, I said, you know, I, I have G-O-D. He opens doors. You know? <laughs> so, so what happened was I told him, he said, you're going to have to stop that. You're not going to do it anymore. And I said, no, I'm not going to stop it. I uh, I told him, I said, let me I said, let me tell you. He said, well, I'm the, I'm the guy who booked your show. And I said, well, let me take out my contract. So he dug it out of his briefcase. And I said, look at this paragraph right here. See what this says. It says, artists shall control all artistic content of said show. Mm. That means I'm the artist. That means I'm not going to stop witnessing. That means I'm not going to stop singing about Jesus. Uh, that's great. 
Yeah. But he uh, he was very upset with me, very, very upset with me. But I, you know, I went over there to witness about Christ. And uh, he did, the devil kicked me out. I had, you know, to be honest with you, what the promoter did, he split. We played all of these big, we played Cardiff Arena Wills. Uh, we played uh, uh, Wembley. We played uh, the SEC Arena in Scotland, in Glasgow, Scotland. I mean, talking about, we're talking about big venues. And he took off for the money and didn't, he had given us a down payment. But praise God, we had tickets to get back. But I had 15 people. And uh, so I tell people, Lord took me over there, but the devil kicked me out. Uh. <laughs> so I went home and I had to take my savings to pay all the people, but I paid all the people i paid them off wow. John Sack, he said you know they would fly you make you fly back and forth and cost you so much money and even if uh and when you won the suits you may never get your money so we just we just dropped it and i just said i chalked it up and said lord i did this on your, your behalf you said you would restore everything the canker worm has eaten so he got that wow and i had some you know i was persecuted for christ's sake but i never you, know, you asked me how it had I this happened to me prior, I would have said, okay, I won't sing no more gospel, I won't witness no more. But after that day, I didn't care who I was bold. Mm -hmm. And I didn't care who uh said what, I was going to lift up Jesus Christ no matter what. That's why I was there. And the other thing, the Holy Spirit, you know, as you know, without the Holy Spirit, you know, we're just kind of wallowing around out there without any power at all but after i had jesus baptized me in the holy spirit personally and i was so full of him i could have cared less to, somebody could have walked up and said do you believe in jesus i'm going to shoot you right here i go ahead go ahead and shoot yeah i believe in it mm -hmm. i don't care what you, do. you know I, my life was changed in the fact that i no longer feared death i no longer feared the world i was going to as my science is back here my ministry lift up jesus no matter what so that's how my life changed. Mm. And uh, I began to write gospel songs. I laughed because I tried. Everybody asked me, Randy, and I should know they did to you too. They asked me, said, what did Jesus look like? And I said, well, you know, I knew it was him the minute I saw him. But I'm, I'm an artist. Now, I don't do any art anymore, but I could have probably painted a picture of him or whatever. And I would say, well, I can't remember. I can't remember. So I asked the Lord. I said, Lord. Why? Why won't you let me remember your face? And you know what he said to me? He said, wait, I told you in the scriptures, you used to worship me in spirit and truth, not a picture of me. Mm. He said, you'd be making a picture and worshiping that picture. And I said, you're to worship me in spirit and truth. Got nothing to do with what I look like. Has everything to do with who, with who I am. So I never asked him no more. I said, okay, I asked, you answered me. That's, that's it. I didn't go any further. But um, he he just totally changed my life, totally. That's all I want. And it's just like you, Randy. You have a ministry that you can reach people that that most people could never reach. You know, he, he's put you in that position. And he's put me in a position of people. I tell people that love Jesus, I mean, love Elvis. I say, listen, don't worship him. He was a man. Mm -hmm. It's okay to love his music. It's all right. It's okay, but don't worship him. Get him off the pedestal. He was just a man, and he died. God gave him a really great talent. He was nice looking. That's all. You know, you have people that have shrines to him. Yes, it's so sad. Well, I think it, I think it's interesting that um, that you were ready to give it up. Uh, yeah, and uh, and the Lord told you no that He wanted I, you to continue. So. There was a reason behind that. It, it blew my mind. Because I, I went out, just to tell you, funny, I went out and bought some three-piece suits and went down and had new pictures made, <laughs> looking like a preacher. <laughs> <laughs> I ended up having to throw them all away. But when the Lord told me, he said, you know, I didn't call you out. What are you doing? What's wrong with you? And so I said, man, oh, man, I'm sorry. He said, I didn't call you. He, he said this to me. He said, wait, he said, do you think it's odd that you've got a different fingerprint than anybody in the world? 
and that you got a different DNA than anybody in the world. You got a different face than you got some people that might look like you, but no one looks exactly like you. He said, why would I want you to be like somebody else? I called you to be who I called you to be. And you use that. He said, I don't want, I don't want another Benny Hinn. <laughs> <laughs> I said, I could probably witness to the hundreds of thousands, Lord. He said, I that no, no, you be who I made you. He said, you put that jumpsuit back on and you go out there and you preach the gospel to people that, that they could never reach. Those people ain't going to go to see them, but they'll come to see you. And I said, OK, that's a, yeah, that's a great lesson because, uh, you know, they for the first time fairly recently, and at least in the UK, uh, professing Christians uh, were in the minority uh, statistically yeah. through uh, surveys yeah. and. You know, I think we're, we're reaching, you're reaching those who would not normally walk into a church and would not listen to a message, let's say, because the, the, the spirit of God is not within them. They, therefore, it doesn't resonate with them. And you reach them through a different uh, venue. And uh, that, that has been uh, uh, more far-reaching than, than, in some cases, some... Some even pastors uh, would be, you know, I, wait, I spoke with, um, in fact, I think it was yesterday or day before yesterday with a grief support group and many of them had lost their, their children or their sons or their daughters. And they said, if I only could see them, cause I don't know if they're in, like you had said earlier, if I, if I knew that they were in heaven had that confirmation, I I would be at peace because I just don't know where they're at now. And the Lord gave that uh, gift to you. So what would you advise those who are going through that now, whether it be um, a child, a, you know, a loved one of, of whatever uh, kind, what would you say to them when they would say, I wish I had that same the same uh, encounter that you had. You know, it's funny that you asked that because <clears throat> what I did after after I uh, had, had received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, the Lord told me, he said, <clears throat> I want you to go into a studio and I want, you know, I, I don't know if anybody does that today, but back then, no one, it was a first. I never seen anyone do that, but I, he said, go into a studio and I want you to put your testimony on a CD. So I, and uh, he said, I want you to give them away. And all I want you to do is tell the person that now that you've listened to this, don't, it didn't cost you anything. Don't keep it, give it to someone else. And so I did, I went in the studio and I, I got down on my knees with my wife and I prayed and I said, I told the engineer, you just turn the mic on and when I get done, you turn it off. So I did, did my whole testimony and I put it on a CD and I had them manufactured and I've given away thousands of them all over the world. And each word said to me, he said, wait, each one of those is a representation of you. You just think everyone that puts that in their car or at home on their stereo, it's like you sitting in the living room or in the car with them. Mm -hmm. And you have no idea how many people you'll reach. So I did that. And I've given it to so many people who have lost children. And uh, they they don't know where they're at. And I tell people, well, you know, the Bible says until we're until." we're at an age of accountability. Now, it doesn't say what that age is, but I really believe this, Randy, that God takes it into his consideration what that child's been through. If that child's been through a ton of abuse, no peace in his life, mm -hmm. and everything else, he's a merciful God. Yes. And he's not a God ready to break your neck, hang you, or just cast you into hell. He wants us to be saved because he loves us and i've told people that you know i i don't know why he allowed i mean i was in grief you know when you go to your daughter's grave every single day and all prostrate over it and write her letters on top of letters and stick them down in the tombstone knowing i couldn't live i just i, I couldn't see a chance for me to live my brothers and sisters told me they, they, they looked any day for me to commit suicide, but that wasn't going to happen. I wasn't going to kill myself. But I, I love my daughter that much, and I wanted her so bad. So Jesus, out of the love and mercy, 
and grace in his heart did that for me. Now, he's not a respecter of persons. And I can't tell you why that Randy Kay got killed and, and went to heaven. And Wade didn't. Wade, Wade, God came in person to him. I tell people, I, it wasn't a vision. I was driving my pickup truck nine o'clock in the morning. I seen him in the flesh. I mean, you know, he appeared to the apostles in the flesh. He ate fish with them. But I saw my daughter and him in the flesh. They were sitting there beside my car, suspended four feet off the ground. But why he did that for me, maybe so that my testimony, your testimony has helped so many people, Randy. And the ministry that you have, I know for a fact, because I've told so many people about your program. Mm. And so many of those people have watched and told other people. I Every single time that I teach my Bible study, I say, please, please go visit Randy K. Heavenly Encounters on YouTube. Mm. It will change your life. It will make you not fear death anymore. It will show you that Jesus is real and hell is real. It will change your, and I, I tell them every single time. And so, so many of them had wrote me back and said, I saw it, boy, thank you. It blessed me. And then my friends have watched it and they've called their friends and they've watched it. So <laughs> you're reaching, as you know, you're reaching people that other people can't reach. Yeah. So God, he didn't call me to do what you're doing and he didn't call you to do what I'm doing. But we do what we can do. Our gift, our talent will make a way for us. Amen. Amen. You know, I often uh, tell those who have lost loved ones that God loved your loved one, your son, yes. your daughter, your wife, your husband, whoever it happened to be, your friend, more than you loved them. And when you think of that, what would you do for that loved one? Well, in some cases, uh, we would be willing to give our lives for that loved one. Well, and uh, God, did, God did that. He did that. He gave his life, his only begotten son, Jesus on the cross for your, for yeah. your loved one. Before, we, before I have that uh, honor to pass uh, the prayer uh, over to you, way to pray for our, pray for our audience, a um, couple of things I wanted to ask you about. Where uh, can people get a hold of you, find out more, uh, download your music and all of that good good stuff? If they look up Elvis Wade on the internet, they can find out so much. There's tons of stuff on the internet about me. And, uh, you know, I had my own website for years, which was a great website. But when I went through those four years off of the thing, I kind of let it go down because I was off the grid for four years and we got so much mail and I couldn't answer it. And uh, it was just a, almost a waste because I didn't know when I got, you know, I, I take what I, my oncologist laughs because I tell him I take my Jesus pill every day. I qualified mm -hmm. for the pill. So I have to take it every day for the rest of my life. Although I told him, listen, Jesus can do what he wants to. And he's the one that's healing me. And uh, so I'm fine. And I can sing, I haven't lost my voice. Uh, you know, pain is pretty much gone away. And uh, the lungs, I have 99% lung capacity. And I give glory to him. And uh, so, I'm sorry, I got I rambled off to what you asked well, me. Well, I just wanted to clearify that you are a can what, what is oh, commonly called a cancer me. survivor. Right, yes. But they can reach me. My email address is e like Elvis. Wade Cummins at gmail.com. E Wade Cummins at gmail.com. And I do my best to answer every one of them personally. And uh, I have counseled so many people that have lost children. You know, until you've been through something, Randy, you know this, it's hard to counsel someone. I've never been in prison, so I, I can't, even though I went in and did prison ministry, I, I, I can't relate to them in the way of spending years in prison. And uh, I can't, can't counsel people that are on drugs because I've never been on drugs. But God has people out there that have been in prison, have been saved, can give them a testimony how they brought them out. And so God lets me minister to those that, uh, with things that I've been through and can help them. Mm -hmm. And I tell them the biggest thing that they need to know, as you know, Jesus is real. There is no ifs, ands, buts, maybes about it. I don't lie. 
Yeah. I saw him. I talked with him. He is real. And I tell him, I got good news. So is heaven. But then I got bad news. So is hell. And you don't want to go there. You don't want to go there. Mm. Get your life right with him. Mm. I just taught Sunday morning on Are You Ready? <laughs> <laughs> and that's what we need to find out in our lives. Are we really ready? Are you involved in something calling yourself a Christian right now? Are you real? Are you ready to go and commit an adultery? Are you ready to go watching pornography? Are you ready to go in whatever you're involved in thinking that God's grace is going to cover you? You know, you just better be ready to go when he comes. Yes. Amen to that. You know, your daughter could testify to that who is in heaven today. You know, yes. in the moment of time, I can testify to that. Uh, I was in, it was in good health and then bang, I was gone. So we never know. Well, we never know. Well, well, um, let me keep the rapture too. I did, you know, and I'm not, you know, I've watched some of your programs and some of your people just ramble on for a long time and I love it. But, you know, people, you can only hold their attention for so long. But at some point, if you ever want to, I saw the rapture, the Lord, and it was a vision. He took me into and showed me the rapture. Wow. And it was, it was phenomenal. Well, tell us a little bit about that, please. Well, I was worshiping him on, on my chair in the living room. And I, I was back listening to praise and worship. And I had my hands up worshiping God. And the tears were just rolling. You the tears were just rolling on my cheek. And all of a sudden, the Lord took me into, in, into this vision. And I seen him above the clouds standing on the cloud and i seen this multitude of people around him and they were dancing and the music was playing and they were dancing while in jesus uh, you know i tell people he loves he would throw his head back the most beautiful smile you ever seen on your face and just laugh and laugh watching his people having a great time dancing and then i would look back down at the people and he would be down there with them dancing with them arm in arm twirling them around and laughing and then I'd look back up and he'd still be up there. Doing, and I said, Lord, to him, I said, Lord, how am I seeing you both places? He said, I'm omnipresent. I said, oh, OK. And then I saw 12 guys standing off to the right. And they were standing separately and they were watching and really joyful. Well, I didn't realize at the time that there were the 12 apostles. And I saw this long line coming out from, from heaven from a long distance away. And they were they were in single file. And they kept coming closer. And as they got to Jesus, the first the music stopped and everybody stopped and looked at the first person in line. And he looked up at Jesus and he said, I was blind and you heal my eyes. And the crowd went nuts. And Jesus threw his head back, laughed. The music started up and they started dancing again. And then the, and then the second guy, the first guy was gone. The second guy looked, the music stopped. He looked up at Jesus and said, I was lame and you heal my legs. And I walked again. And the crowd went nuts again. And this went on, people he had healed here on this earth. And every time that one would say that, the crowd would go nuts and they would uh, go crazy and dancing and laughing and rejoicing. And I realized this line coming were, was the people that were coming to meet <coughs> the people in the air. They were in the air and uh, they were rejoicing with every testimony. It was just like, oh, and I was so full of the Holy Spirit, just weeping and weeping so happy so full of joy and i looked over at the 12 guys the lord had me look over them and they were shaking hands like i've never seen anybody shake hands before and uh, when i came out i told my when i came out my wife saw me crying she said what's wrong with you i said oh god sandy i said you have no idea i said i just saw the rapture i just saw the rapture she said really and i said yes and i said oh so cool so wonderful and i i said i don't know why and I got to tell you, I asked the Lord, Randy, which he spoke to me this. I said, Lord, who am I that you would show this to? You know what he said to me? Who are you that I would not? Ah, love it. Love it. That, that... No one's more perfect on this earth than any one of us. Yeah. He's going to show it. He showed to anybody. He said, who are you that I would not? Man. So she said, show me how they were shaking hands. So I said, well, they were shaking hands like this. I, they put their arms out like this right here. They grabbed the elbow on the inside and the elbow on the other side. And the other person grabbed this elbow and this elbow. And I said, they were shaking hands like this. And I, and I looked down and I just went crazy again. It, it was a cross. Oh. Their hands were a cross. And I just started weeping again. Again, they were, they were shaking hands, not in hands. They were shaking hands at elbow 
inside elbow to inside across each other, and their arms together made a cross. Wow. Yeah. Oh. It was phenomenal. It was absolutely phenomenal. And uh, then I seen this multitude. I mean, Randy, as far as I could see, rushing, running towards the crowd that was with Jesus. Multitude, multitudes of people. And I said to him, I said, Lord, who are those multitudes? And he said, those are the people that have already died and went to heaven, coming back to meet mm -hmm. their loved ones here in the air. Yeah. And I started crying. I said, oh, God, can't take it. Mm -hmm. Don't let me see Misty again. I can't handle it. Please, please let me out of this vision right now. I didn't want to. I couldn't see her again. I just knew that it would hurt me. It would kill me. Mm -hmm. And it instantly took me out of it. Wow. But what what a what a sight the rapture is going to be! Oh. What a sight! You know, I bear witness with that, uh, my brother, because of what I beheld in heaven. So when you were talking about it, it just, it just, um, yeah, I just bear witness to that. And you know, also um, switching uh, gears a little bit, um, I I do love the movie the identical which you which you wrote and it's based on your life uh people can can look for that it's a major motion picture um get your tissues ready when you watch that though there's a there's an ending that is so poignant and so you know just just very it evokes emotion so deeply and um then that's another. Uh, I guess uh, they can go. Any any suggestion as to where people can see the identical? Well, you know, it actually, it was out in 2013. It was on Netflix. It was on you know all the movie channels. But you can also you can get it for free on YouTube now. So you know you'll probably get some interruptions on YouTube. For, they'll put some uh, commercials up, but you can watch it on YouTube now. It was out in 2013. Yeah. But, but I'm going to say this: if you if you have any adopted children, like I have two adopted grandchildren, and uh, I couldn't love them anymore. I love them so, oh, so very much. I, mm. You know, there's no difference. And people, if you have adopted children in your life, this movie will speak to you like no other movie. Mm. It, uh, yeah. No, I, I, I agree. I mean, it is just amazing. Uh, I have an adopted uh, son as well. So, uh, yes, it spoke to me that way also. We'll have the links to all of what Wade has shared with us so you can get in touch with him, a link to the film, and also... Uh, Let me say this. If they will friend me on Facebook, it's Wade Cummins. Now, I have several sites, but I only look after one myself. It's Wade Cummins, and it has a picture of me and my wife, Sandy, it says Elvis Wade, Sandy Posey on the on the page. If they'll friend me, I teach Bible on Monday nights, Thursday nights, and I preach Sunday mornings. And uh, so they can reach me through there, too. Well, we'll put the link to uh, that Facebook page as well. Yeah, so thank you for that. And now, uh, my brother, um, one of my favorite parts, if not my favorite, is I get the hand the microphone over to you uh to pray for our audience please yes 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 let's pray father god father god father god we love you so very very much lord we only want everyone to go to heaven we don't want anyone to go to hell but lord it's, a, it's it's something that doesn't come from works it comes from grace and comes from love lord let these people who are watching tonight know how much you love them. You're not ready to cast them into hell. You want them to be saved. Yes. But you offered, Lord, you have offered a way out. And, you know, you're not going to have a, an excuse when, when, when you stand before Jesus of why you didn't accept the free gift. And so, Lord, I pray that you'd speak to every heart, every heart that's watching this. I pray that they would tell other people, you've got to watch this. You have to see this. Not for my sake, only for Jesus is the only reason why we want them to watch, Lord. He said, if I be lifted up, not if Wade be lifted up, not if Elvis be lifted up. He said, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto me. So, Lord, I pray that they, that they would see that you are lifted up in this program. 
and that they would see that they need a transformation in their lives. And only Jesus, the devil would lie to you and tell you that you've, you've got to become good enough. But that's a lie. That's why the song says, just as I am, he will clean you up. You can't wait until you stop sinning. you got to give your life to him now. Don't believe the lies of the enemy. He will tell you that you're young enough, that you can do this when you're older. And when you get older, he'll tell you it's too late. He just lies to you all the way through your life. When is the right time? The right time is now, today, this minute, this second. Give your life to him. He said, all who call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. He said, those who believe in their heart. Listen, the devil believes and trembles, but he will not be saved. Your heart is the full makeup of who you are. If you totally believe in your heart, which is every part of you, your being, and accept him and call upon him and ask him to be Lord of your life, he will. He will come in and sup with you and you will never be changed. And I have never met one Christian that truly loved the Lord that ever regretted it. And you will not regret it. You'll have the peace that surpasses all understanding. And so, Lord, as this transfers, I just pray, Father, that the hearts will be touched. I pray right now for this ministry. Randy has no idea the people he's reaching, and what he's doing. But until he reaches heaven again, Lord, and sees the multitude of people that were saved through the ministry that he's had, showing people what heaven and hell is like from a personal standpoint of view, not from what he's heard, but what he personally has seen, Father, in Jesus' name. Bless this ministry, Father. Carry it all over the world. We bind the enemy from coming against it in any way we speak. In the name of Jesus, we declare it. It shall be wonderful. It shall go into not millions, but billions of homes in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you so much. And I ask our audience to join in prayer for Wade Cummins now, that the Lord would completely... Uh, continue to restore his health so that he might live uh, either your either your second coming Lord or your rapture or Amen. Lord that you would carry out his full ministry which is so powerful Lord uh, we thank you and praise you for our dear brother Wade and we ask that you would just reach every cell within his body and that you would restore wholeness to each cell within the body and any cell that would be uh, cancerous or or otherwise uh, unhealthy that you would now dispel that get rid of it and lord that uh, only health would be imparted vis-a-vis -vis your power your authority and jesus christ so thank you wade cummins it has been such a pleasure to be with you today i'm here randy if you ever need me you call and I'll be there. Well, we have a conference coming up and Renee said that would be wonderful to have you there. So uh, be careful what you uh, what you offer. So um, also uh, just in, in closing, I want to say that um, we have some uh, great news for you. And that is that if indeed you had prayed that prayer and you know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, be of good cheer because heaven is in your future. Take care yeah. and God bless. Thanks for listening. Please like and subscribe. And if you'd like further information, go to our website at randyk.org, where our mission is simple, to share the great news of God's love.